And uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I, I sense you out there. Uh, we're going to talk about fruit trees today. Uh, and um, uh, fruit trees are kind of like uh, real estate. Uh, it's location, location, location. Uh, you have to have the right spot for a fruit tree or you will be frustrated with it. Uh, and that right spot really means a full day of sun. Uh, uh, if you think about all the sweetness that a good fruit develops and the flavors, that takes a huge amount of energy and that all has to come from the sun. And uh, you can't do with less than 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, any any sunshine before 10 a.m. is too weak, and anything after 4 p.m. is too weak. So, uh, if you want real good success, find the sunniest spot in your uh, vicinity and plan to grow your fruit trees there. Um, the second thing is you have to be able to have decent drainage for them. So, if your only sunny spot is that swale where the water sits after every rainstorm for three days, that's not a good location for a fruit tree. Um, you can test your drainage by digging a hole and pouring, filling it up with water. If it drains within a few hours, you're fine. Um, if it takes a day or two days to drain, that's not a good spot for your fruit tree. Uh, without doing something special like elevating it on a hill kind of uh, which can work, but makes it a little difficult horticulturally to keep it going. Um, the third is you have to have it in a spot where you can irrigate it. Um, none of the fruit trees are designed to be able to go through the summer without any irrigation, at least until they are five or six years old. Um, they've got to develop very deep roots for that. And if they uh, suffer from uh, dryness during the course of the growing season, it's going to affect the fruit, can result in the fruit dropping off or the, the fruit having bad texture or poor flavor. Uh, so you've got to be able to get at it with your irrigation system or a hose or something so that you can irrigated from about uh, June through, well, through dormancy or when the rains start again. Um, and then you need room to grow. Uh, that's something we'll talk about in quite a bit of detail here today. But, um, and, and that's something that's a little bit under your control in the sense that you can keep a tree to a decent size uh, even if uh, you have a relatively small space, but it just means it's a lot more work. Uh, you have to prune it regularly uh, so that you keep it to that size. And if it gets away from you, then it's difficult to bring it back down to size uh, quickly. You can do it over a few seasons. Uh, but the ideal size for a tree, uh, even though they'll grow bigger without pruning, is if you can reach the top of it so that you can pick the fruit without having to climb up a ladder. That, that's ideal for most of us. And uh, you know, although most fruit trees will grow to 15 to 20 feet, um, there's not much point in letting them do that because you are not gonna climb a 20 foot ladder uh, if one is even made. Uh, and so all that fruit up at the top is gonna go to waste and uh, you're going to have trouble spraying it during the winter, dormant spraying it. Uh, there's all kinds of problems when they get too big. Uh, plus, they get broken branches that you can't prune out and diseases. And so keeping a tree small is really critical. Uh, and, and Elizabeth's uh, pruning class, by the way, is going to help you do that. So be sure I, I get to host that one. So uh, I'll, I'll give it a plug. Uh, it'll be very helpful. Um, and then compatibility with your existing landscape. Um, I mean, you, you don't want to put the fruit tree in the middle of your cactus garden. Uh, and likewise, you don't want to put it in the middle of your lawn. Um, in the cactus garden, it's going to get too little water or the cactus are going to get too much. 
And in the lawn, the tree is going to get too much water uh, and uh, it'll either affect the fruit or it will get it'll affect the trunk of the tree where it gets too wet and it gets crown rot, something like that. Um, so it needs a little bit of a dedicated spot. Uh, the dedicated spot can be in a container, um, and we'll talk about that some more. Um, most fruit trees can grow just fine in a large-ish container uh, for a long time. And the deciduous fruit trees, like I don't know if these are on screen, are they, Jen? No. Um, deciduous fruit trees, meaning the ones that lose their leaves in the winter, which is most of the stone fruits, uh, plums, peaches, uh, apricots, nectarines, apples, pears. Um, they have the advantage that after a few years in a container, if you need to, you can, uh, during the winter when it's lost its leaves, you just knock it out of the container, cut the leaves back, cut the top back a bit, and uh, replant it in the container, and it's not even going to know what happened um, because it's a leaf, basically. So it's, uh, it has anesthesia. It won't know. <laughs> um, the the trees are there are a lot of terms we're going to go through here because they're confusing to people and, and um, I hope we'll clarify them and give you some tools for figuring out um, what's best for you but um, there are different size fruit trees that are sold and they go by names like standard semi dwarf ultra dwarf dwarfy 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 dwarf um, that sort of thing. And uh, a standard tree usually will get up in the neighborhood of 20 feet uh, if it's not pruned. Uh, a semi dwarf tree is only going to be dwarfed by about 20%. So um, that might be 15 feet, something like that. An ultra dwarf tree is more like um, going to grow to. 60 to 70 percent of uh, full size. And then there are a few, mainly peaches and nectarines that are super dwarfs. Um, and they only get up to about six feet even after many, many, many years. Uh, and they're kind of fun. Um, a little tiny tree with full size peaches hanging on it is, is very impressive and fun to see. Uh, and they're excellent for containers. Uh, they're, they're usually stocky. They'll have a trunk about this big around, uh, but they'll only be you know, four feet tall. And, uh, and they'll give you lots of pretty blossoms and fruit. Um, but regardless of what the tree says on it, in terms of whether it's dwarf, semi-dwarf, ultra-dwarf, et cetera, you can keep the tree to the size that you want it, and you should do it, uh, so that it doesn't get too big on you. Uh, aim the camera over here, Jan, again. Mm -hmm. um, this uh, is a Santa Rosa plum on a uh, semi dwarf root stock. Um, and you can see it's already a good eight feet tall. Uh, because it really hasn't been pruned much. It's got a nice little branch structure, uh, but it is, like most plums, very vertical in its growth when it's young, and uh, it wants to get up there and get to the sunlight. Uh, uh, it's old enough to have flowers. I can recognize that there are flower buds on these branches here. Uh, and so uh, if this were mine, um, I would cut it like this, uh, and maybe I'll save this one for Elizabeth to work on uh, so that uh, I could bring it down and uh, have a tree that I could easily harvest from year after year. Um, some of the trees, like uh, plums when they're young, apricots, peaches, nectarines, all their lives need to be pruned regularly for fruit production. Uh, because they only make fruit on the previous year's new growth. Um, so you have to keep them putting on new growth over and over again. Um, plums, that's only true when they're younger. When they're older, they develop uh, spurs that make fruit year after year. And uh, apples and 
pears both grow on, they flower on spurs that last year after year after year. So you don't have to worry about pruning them for fruit production. Um, but uh, keep in mind that you want to keep a fruit tree small. And so when you choose a fruit tree, um, it it's fine if it's a little skinny whip like this. This is a Fuji apple on the exotically named M111 rootstock. It sounds like a freeway in uh, <laughs> England. Um, but it's a, it's a semi-dwarf tree. Um, this is what we would call a whip. So it's basically just uh, a trunk that's unbranched at this point. I, I wouldn't call these little flimsy things branches at this point. And so you would have the opportunity here to buy a tree that's presently about six feet tall, a little less than that if it were in the ground because it's sitting up in its can. Um, but if you could um, cut it off quite low so that it started to branch at the three foot level or so, um, so that you could have three or four feet of good branching and then keep it at that height. Uh, of course, it's a little different if you have a situation where you want to be able to walk under the tree, then you have to clip it at about six feet so that it'll branch below that and you can maybe duck under it if you go right next to the trunk, but you'll be able to walk under it. But most of the time, you're not growing your fruit trees as shade trees. Um, and you want to make that first cut so that they branch out quite low and you can keep them under control that way. Um, so let's go through a few of the confusing terms that um, people ask about. Uh, obviously, the first one is deciduous versus evergreen. Deciduous meaning they lose their leaves in the winter. Evergreen meaning they stay green all year round. About the only thing we grow around here that's evergreen are citrus um, in, in terms of fruit trees. Um, almost all the rest of our fruit trees are deciduous uh, and they are available during the winter like this uh, as a fresh crop, if you will because they're grown out in a, an orchard and then they're dug up and the dirt is washed off the roots and the roots are trimmed and they're what are called bare root trees. Um, it's just a descriptive term because the roots are bare. In the old days, we would get bundles of these trees in and then we would just heal them into a big pile of sawdust and sell them out of the sawdust to people and they take them home and plant them. Nowadays, more often you'll find the bare root tree has been planted in a container, uh, usually a five gallon size container. And there are advantages and disadvantages to that. The main disadvantage is it probably costs you a little more because someone's done the labor of planting it. Um, but the real advantage is that the tree can almost immediately start growing roots into the soil in the container. Um, if it were merely healed into the sawdust, it would start growing roots too. And by, say, uh, the end of February, if the tree hadn't sold, um, it would start taking root in the sawdust. And when you pulled it out, you'd break a bunch of those little new roots and it would have to start over with that. Um, whereas here, um, it, it'll make an easy transition into the soil in your garden because it's already got a start here. Um, so bare root simply means a deciduous tree is dug up and the roots are bared and it's ready for sale. Um, grafted uh, and budded are basically the same thing for all practical purposes. Um, a graft is merely means that you are grafting two different trees together so that they'll, the graft will heal and they will continue to grow. They'll still be two separate trees genetically. There's no, um, uh, genetic modification going on with grafting. 
Uh, but the reason it's done is that over thousands of years, um, the fruit that we eat has been selected by farmers and consumers as the ones they like, and they've been reproduced vegetatively so that they're not changed genetically, so that a Fuji apple remains a Fuji apple all over the world. Um, but they're grown on a rootstock that is adaptable to different soil types that may be more um, resistant to diseases uh, or that may dwarf it a little bit, a dwarfing rootstock. And so the rootstocks, if, if you went to a production facility for fruit trees, you'd see rows and rows and rows of the rootstock, which is just an apple or a plum tree being grown for the value of its rootstock. Rows and rows of those trees, and then uh, those get cut off, and the scion, the part that is the name variety, in this case, it's a, this is a plum. Peach. <laughs> no, it's a donut peach. Mm -hmm. um, a little piece of the donut peach it would be cut off and grafted onto the rootstock, or in budding, you, you simply cut one of these buds and slip it into the bark of the rootstock, and then it grows up. And we can see on all of these trees where they were grafted or budded. Mm -hmm. um, this scar right here is the graft point. And you can see that the, the rootstock, which is this part, looks a little different bark-wise than the donut peach bark um, because it is a different tree. Uh, I don't know, this is on M111. Uh, oh no, this is the apple, I'm sorry. This is the apple. So this is Fuji apple with the little speckles on it. And this is the M111 rootstock, which is a, a different kind of apple. Uh, and um, uh, always, uh, on these fruit trees, you'll find a graft point, and it's good to be able to recognize it. Uh, it's a little bit of a vulnerability on a tree um, because if you were to put pressure on it to the point where that graft snapped, um, you wouldn't have the Fuji apple any longer, mm -hmm. and whatever grew up from the rootstock would not be probably edible apple. It would be some nasty little crab apple. Um, that wouldn't interest you. Uh, so you want to um, be a little careful. You also want to point the graft, if you can, point it to the north, that's about that way, so that the sun is shining over here on the, and, and this is shading the graft point a little bit so that it doesn't dry out and get scorched much. Um, if you've ever seen going through the valley lines of trees with uh, whitewash on the trunks, um, that's basically designed to shade them from the scorching sun of the Central Valley. Uh, and although we're not quite that hot, we're, we're hot enough that it's good to point it to the north if you can uh, to give it a little protection. And then also staking the tree is important when you plant it so that you don't get the pressure on the graph that might break it, uh, at least when it's, when it's young. Um, okay, back to terms. Um, the variety of a, of a tree simply means the common, common name that you're used to. Uh, if you like um, pink lady apples, Pink Lady is the variety, uh, or Golden Delicious, or Red Delicious, or Macintosh. Those are all varieties of apples. Uh, Stella Cherry, or a Bing Cherry, uh, a Blenheim Apricot. Um, those are variety names, and, and those are simply, as I said, selections over the years of characteristics that people like, and then they, they give them a name. Uh, or a grower, developer creates through uh, probably many years and trials of growing different um, 
combinations. Uh, you take a, a red delicious apple and cross pollinate it with a Fuji apple and see what you get. Uh, and it might be good. And again, this is not this is not genetic engineering. This is old fashioned cross pollinization hybridization, uh, which is the way that uh, food varieties have been developed from the get go. Um, very natural. Um, but you do end up with essentially two different trees growing. One is the rootstock and one is the part that you eat. Um, now, uh, often they're grown um, and priced by what we call caliper, which is the diameter of the um, top of the tree. Um, three quarters of an inch would be a good sized tree. That's a caliper about like that. Um, sometimes they're quite a bit smaller. Uh, and sometimes you can find a tree that's a little older. Uh, and uh, in some ways, size matters in this case. Um, a, a fatter tree is probably an older tree and a more vigorous tree. Uh, so it's, uh, it's not a bad idea to, if you've got two possibilities, two Fuji apples, and one's a little fatter than the other, all things being equal, other things being equal, get the bigger one. Um, it, it does correlate with age to some extent. Um, you will see references on most fruit trees to chill hours. Um, this does not mean hours that they spend chilling in front of the uh, boob tube. Um, this is hours below 45 degrees, um, basically fall through spring. Uh, and trees have a chill requirement. Um, so uh, if your area and the Bay Area gets in the neighborhood of 500 chill hours. That's, that's just a good round number. 500 chill hours a year. If you're looking at a tree in a catalog, for instance, that says it needs 1,200 chill hours, don't buy it. Um, it will not be happy in our area. We're not cold enough for it. Um, some of them go down as low as 200 chill hours. I don't know any that are zero chill hours, uh, but we get chill hours here, even though we're not, uh, you know, frozen under a blanket of snow. We get enough hours under 45 degrees that if you uh, go with the varieties that um, your garden center knows works in your area, knows work in your area, uh, you'll be fine uh, with the hours. So people usually get into problems when they're buying uh, mail order um, from the East Coast and uh, they get varieties that really don't work well here. Um, and, and I do want to make a pitch for the sort of the tried and true varieties. Um, uh, they, a Santa Rosa plum is a wonderful plum, locally developed. Luther Burbank developed it in his, uh, his facility outside of Santa Rosa. Um, Satsuma is another wonderful plum. That, um, there, those are both types of Japanese plums, which are the ones that work best here. And European plums will grow, um, but they're later and they're subject to more difficulties because they have a longer uh, ripening and growing period. The Japanese plums happen a little quicker, and so they're less subject to disease and pest problems, uh, and they happen to be very, very tasty. Um, so if you grow a tried and true variety, and a, a Fuji apple does very well in here, and if you grow your own Fuji apple and pick it and eat it, uh, I guarantee it'll be tastier than any exotic variety that you uh, buy at the store. Uh, and it just because it'll be so fresh, uh, doesn't have to be picked and warehoused and transported and re-warehoused and put on the, on the store shelves over a period of time. Um, so and even though there are thousands of varieties um, of, of fruit out there, uh, you won't find those thousands at your local garden center. You'll find a few varieties of each kind of fruit. Um, 
don't be afraid to pick one of those varieties. It, it will work for you. And uh, uh, if you want to be more exotic, then branch out after you get a few going that you really like. Um, Self-fertile versus needs a pollinator. Well, most of the fruits that you will find are self-fertile, meaning that the pollen from their flowers will fertilize that same flower. Uh, and the bees don't have to go off and find another another variety to pollinate it with. Uh, a few will need pollinators, and they'll usually say on the tags that they need a pollinator, and they'll suggest a variety that will pollinate it. But obviously, that means you need two different trees, uh, at the very least. Um, so most of the varieties that you'll find at most of the garden centers will be self-fertile, uh, and then you don't have to worry about a pollinator. Um, that's why, uh, for instance, um, a Stella cherry, even though it's maybe not the most well-known, um, is a wonderful home garden cherry. It's a, a nice black cherry, like a Bing cherry. Um, and there are self-fertile Bing cherries, but most of the Bing cherries you find in the stores uh, need a pollinator and uh, they can be a little disappointing as a result. So if you're gonna get a bean cherry, get a self-fertile bean cherry. Um, and it'll it, say that on the tag, right? It'll say that, I should say it on the tag, right. Uh, if it's just bean, it's not self-fertile. If it's self-fertile bean, it is. <clears throat> and there are actually two different varieties of beans. Um, <clears throat> now, um, planting the fruit trees is straightforward. I mean, it's like planting any other plant. You want to mix some organic matter into the soil. Um, I'll talk about growing them in pots as well. Um, something like uh, here at Slope, we sell the Slope planting mix, which is a nice compost bee, bark bee mix of uh, organic matter that can mix with your soil. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, you want to mix it about half and half with the soil that you uh, dig out of the hole. And the hole should be just about the same depth as the uh, container soil. Um, so that it, the problem with digging deeper and mixing that soil is then the organic matter underneath the tree is going to decompose. The tree is going to settle down in the hole, and soil is going to slump around the crown of the tree, and then it can stay too wet and be subject to attack from bacteria and fungi, and you can have problems. So you always want to set the roots onto solid ground in the bottom of your hole, and then be liberal in the diameter of the hole, uh, and mix. Uh, the organic matter about half and half with the soil you take out of the hole to make a transition zone. But you're remembering that the tree has to grow in your soil ultimately. And you're never going to dig, dig such a big hole that you're going to make a perfect bathtub for the tree to grow in. That's not the goal. Uh, now, in a container, you want to use a good quality potting soil. Um, the slope organic potting soil is excellent. Um, <clears throat> a good potting soil has a mixture of materials and sizes of bits of, well, there's no real soil in them. They're uh, bark and peat moss and compost and sand and rock. But <laughs> it's important that they be different sizes of particles. Um, research has shown that that's really the, the critical component of a good quality potting soil. And then some features such as some added, um, sometimes they add bat guano, uh, uh, feather meal, things like that that give some nitrogen that's long lasting gives a little start on fertilizing the tree as it grows in. Uh, and then using a, a 
a well balanced all purpose fertilizer, which is the EB stone fruit berry and vine food. Um, gives the tree all the different kinds of nutrients it's going to need, as well as some uh, uh, mycorrhizal fungi, which help to make the connection between the soil and the plants and the roots. Um, so it's a good idea to put that in at planting time so that uh, uh, it's already there. It's, it's more effective down in the root zone than it is up on the top, trickling down in. Um, and um, just a word about staking. I don't really have a demonstration here, but the, the best way to stake a tree is with two stakes uh, on either side of the tree with some room in between. If this is the trunk, the stake would be over here somewhere and then over here somewhere, and then a flexible tie between. This allows the tree to blow a little bit in the wind, uh, but prevents it from being blown down. And the reason you want it standing up on its own most of the time is that, uh, again, research has shown that the tree will develop essentially stronger bones um, by standing on its own than if you stake it rigidly. Uh, these trees, you'll notice, are staked rigidly. This is, uh, this is simply because they're nursery grown um, they are transported in a truck uh, and you need, you, you don't have room to put two stakes on either side. Um, but when you get it home and planted, then I would pull the stake out and put two stakes next to it and put a nice flexible rubber uh, or cloth even tie so that it can blow around a little bit like this, but it can't get knocked over. So that's for staking. Um, staking is a little more difficult in a container. Uh, and um, you probably might need to use some uh, either a rigid stake at the middle or kind of make a tripod of stakes for it um, so that at least it can get uh, some roots into the soil in the, in the container before uh, you let it wave around in the wind too much. If you're in a windy area, I would definitely uh, stake it kind of rigidly in a container because you don't, the container doesn't have enough soil to hold the stakes really securely usually. Um, I really like uh, half wine barrels for fruit trees and there's several reasons. One is they're big enough that the tree can grow there for quite a while, years. Um, but they're also wood, and so they allow you, for instance, you could screw two stakes into the sides of the wine barrel so that they will stay put, and then you could use your flexible ties uh, in that way. You can't do that with a ceramic pot very easily. Uh, so uh, wine barrels are a terrific solution. Uh, they take about two, two of the big bags of soil to fill up a wine barrel, and um, I recommend them highly. Um, now, I wanted to show you this tree over here. Um, uh, this, is, you can see, is in a larger container. Um, this is what we would call uh, euphemistically either a 10 gallon or a 15 gallon container. Um, and, and I say it that way because they're nowhere near that big in reality. Uh, but all nursery containers have these nominal sizes attached to them that um, it are, are sort of like saying this is a two by four, this piece of wood, when in fact it isn't smaller than that. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, this is an apricot tree. It's, it's a, what variety is it? It's a tropic gold. Um, it's, it's a relatively uh, naturally compact apricot, uh, foreign apricot. Uh, and I, I brought it in from the nursery just because it's kind of like a perfect demonstration of the way you want a tree to grow in your home garden um, so that you can get to it. Um, I mean, this is in a container, so if it were in the ground now, it would top out about 
here about my height. Um, and I would be able to reach all parts of it easily for pruning, for picking, for spraying. Uh, and, and I'll talk a little bit about building spraying. Um, and uh, uh, if it were mine, again, I would um, make sure that I trim the top regularly so that it doesn't get much taller than this. And of course, these branches will continue to grow up and I'll continue to thin out the center so that light can get through this way. Um, but the idea would be that uh, I'd be able to reach all parts of the tree. Uh, and, and you know, it doesn't make sense for it to grow up to the ceiling here uh, where I can't get to it. Um, now this also, uh, this Tropic Gold is kind of a neat one because unlike most apricots that put on, oh, 18 inches to two feet of new growth every year, um, this one only puts on a few inches every year. And so you don't have to worry about pruning it as much. Um, because it only puts on a little bit of growth, it doesn't outgrow its ability to make blossoms. Uh, and it even makes little spurs, uh, almost like a, a plum tree uh, that keep blooming year after year. So um, it's, it's a nifty one. Now, the problem, there's only the problem. The problem is that apricots like a lot of heat. So here I am in Mill Valley, uh, and uh, I cannot in good conscience tell most people that uh, an apricot is a good choice for them here um, because in Mill Valley, we have foggy, foggy Junes and Julys. And in, in my world, uh, where I grew up in the Santa Clara Valley, July 4th was apricot picking day. And uh, here, uh, they not only will not be ready July 4th, they might not be ready until <laughs> August or September, and then they won't be as sweet as they should be. So, um, <laughs> apricots are a challenge, but if you're over in Contra Costa, for instance, uh, and have a nice sunny spot, or if you're even in uh, Novato or uh, a place that's a little farther away from the bay where you don't have quite the coastal influence, then something like an apricot or a peach or a nectarine can be grown successfully. Uh, when you're in a cooler climb, as most of the Bay Area is, um, you're better off sticking with apples and pears and plums uh, and cherries even. Um, cherries like the heat, but they will develop even without it. Um, but uh, apricots, peaches, and uh, nectarines, um, those stone fruits need concentrated heat to uh, ripen nicely. Uh, and so if you don't have that spot, don't, you know, don't do it. Um, you're going to be disappointed. Um, now let's see, we're going to talk about some varieties. Um, apples are kind of easy because almost all the varieties are available now at, at the stores that grow well around here. Um, Fuji, Granny Smith, Pink Lady, Gala. Um, those are wonderful apples that all have low chill requirements uh, and will do really well in your home garden. Um, red and yellow, delicious. I, you don't even see them so much in the store, do you? I mean, they have become over overdeveloped to the point where they've lost all their flavor, basically. Uh, if you ever run across an old red delicious apple, which is a, a small apple about this size, you know, as opposed to the giants you see in the store, they are really tasty. Uh, but the ones you get in the store these days, I don't think they're very good. Um, uh, and apples uh, are, are really easy to grow, except, um, you know, they get the cod codling moth larva, which is that famous worm in the apple where you take a bite and you hope you don't see apple worm. Um, uh, 
there are ways to deal with the coddling moments. Um, and if you only have one apple tree, your odds are better than if there are lots of apple trees in the area because the coddling moths only uh, lay their eggs uh, on apple buds. And so if there's only a sole tree, the odds of getting a lot of moths are relatively small. Um, so that's a reason to have um, biodiversity in your orchard um, so that the specialist pests like a coddling moth don't um, get a foothold in there and stay you know, because they've got a wonderful place that they won't like the plum and so they'll go and find somebody who has a whole bunch of apples going together. Um, pears, um, uh, Asian pears have become much more popular and they do very well in the here. Uh, as do Anjou probably does the best. Um, Bartlett's will grow well. Um, I have seen Bosks um, growing here successfully. Uh, my own favorite pair is Comice, um, which uh, is a large and very juicy pair, um, but it takes a little longer to develop. Um, and uh, I don't like, personally, don't like pears well enough that I would spend my time growing them. But for people who do like them, I'd suggest start with an Anjou and, you know, branch out from there. Um, cherries, um, you know, Bing and Stella are, would be the black cherries of choice. Rainier is a, um, a red and yellow cherry. Uh, that does well here, uh, developed in the Northwest. So it can handle our relatively small number of chill hours uh, and is a, a good tasting cherry. And they're often available uh, in the supermarkets. Um, I talked a little bit about plums, the Japanese varieties would be uh, my choices. Um, and uh, if, if you want to grow brooms, for instance, then you would need um, a European um, plum. Um, the, the difference is that a pruning plum has more sugar in it. And so it, it dries into a sweeter, plumper, dried fruit, which is what pruning is. Um, we talked a little already about apricots, peaches, and nectarines. I won't do too much more on that. The donut peach that we have an example of here is a little kind of flat peach. It's very tasty. Uh, and because it's a smaller fruit, I think it ripens better in cooler climates. Uh, and so it's a, a good choice for your first peach. And it's a little bit of a smaller tree, just naturally. Um, and so it's a good starter peach. Um, now figs are another um, deciduous fruit tree. Um, they're uh, not often um, thought of in the same breath with peaches and nectarines, for instance, but um, Jen is getting out a little, uh, um, this is a, a blackjack fig. Uh, don't be fooled. These um, figs are from last year. They may <laughs> they have sat here all winter. Nobody noticed them and ate them. Um, but uh, figs have usually two crops of fruit every year, one in the spring and one in the fall. And around here, our weather is not compatible with the spring crop of figs. And so they usually just fall off before they really develop. So these, uh, even though this is a tiny little tree, uh, it made a fall crop of figs. Um, these aren't any good anymore. And in fact, it's even hard to get them off of here. They're, um, well, I said they're not any good. They, uh, yeah, I mean, they're just all pithy, uh, kind of dried out on the inside and haven't developed, haven't ripened at all because, uh, I don't know why. Uh, I just noticed it the other day, and that's why I brought it here. Yeah. Um, blackjack is a naturally dwarf fig, so if you want to try to grow a big breed, it won't get huge on you. Um, blackjack is a very good um, 
selection, um, as the name implies, it's a dark thing. Um, so similar in look to a mission or a brown turkey. Um, green figs in general are more difficult to ripen here uh, and grow. Um, so if I were to start with a fig, I would start with a dark fig. Um, and Cadotas, uh, uh, for instance, are very difficult to grow here. And they just need more heat. Uh, and I think they need a, uh, a Mediterranean, rocky Mediterranean island to grow on, uh, to be happy or something. Um, but figs uh, in general do very well here. And um, a full-sized fig is a very large tree if you let it go. Um, so you gotta have room for them. But that's a tree that can make a shade tree in the summer. Um, they're big enough to be a useful shade tree. And then they'll lose their leaves in the winter and let some sunlight through. Um, you know, and we talked about plums a little bit already, didn't we? And uh, persimmons. Um, persimmons are um, wonderful looking trees with those big orange fruits hanging on them in the uh, late fall and winter. Um, again, they're a large tree uh, left to their own devices. Uh, and um, uh, we grow basically two kinds, two varieties of persimmons. Uh, Hachia uh, is the larger, kind of shaped like that, uh, very astringent until it's ripe. It has so much tannin in it that you can't even begin to eat it until it's nice and soft. Uh, so you pick them when they're hard usually, then you bring them inside, uh, and you'll see them on people's uh, October and November uh, decorations as they're ripening, and then they'll be ready to eat in about uh, December. And uh, very sweet, um, kind of a combination between a grape and a kiwi and flavor, maybe a little sweeter. Um, and then the Fuyu persimmon is the round, kind of flat one. Um, that you can eat almost immediately on picking, even though it's still hard, um, because they don't have the tannins in them uh, and the sugars are noticeable right away. But they will ripen soft. And uh, you, when they're soft, you can use them for cooking and or eating fresh either way. So they do very well here. They're a tough tree. Um, uh, if you leave the fruit on them, the thrucas will come through each year and eat the fruit. Um, well, some of the fruit. <laughs> and occasionally you see a squirrel running along the fence with a giant persimmon in its mouth. Although I think they're probably too astringent for them as well. Um, we don't grow a lot of nuts in the Bay Area, but some people have them in their home gardens. Almonds will do well here. Uh, and although walnuts will grow here, uh, again, there are big trees that have to be kind of large and to, to make uh, the nuts. And uh, they're not a very practical home garden uh, plant, um, but it is possible to grow them. Uh, now, we, since we're talking about fruit trees, we got to talk about citrus at least a little bit, although I think we'll have another webinar devoted to citrus. Um, but Jen's picking up a true dwarf Valencia orange here. Uh, and it's a really cute little guy. And this is a number of years old. Uh, and you can see it's grown these orange and oranges. I don't usually recommend Valencia oranges to people in, at least in this area. Uh, again, where it's hotter, they can be grown uh, successfully and ripened up. I, I did pick one of them and uh, I told Jen we were gonna taste test it because I was pretty sure it wouldn't be very sweet. Here, Jen, there's your hat. And so we're gonna bravely take a bite of this Valencia orange, and I almost guarantee that we're going to make a face because it's going to taste like a lemon. Mm -hmm. um, so here goes. 
Mm, yeah. Oh, God. Mm, that's pretty tart. Mm -hmm. That's my typical. Mm, yeah. Mm, Clears the sinuses. <laughs> typical Valencia orange experience. Mm. So, what you want to get is a navel orange. Mm. Navel oranges <clears throat> are what you might call California oranges. They don't have any seeds and they're grown for fresh eating, basically. Valencia oranges are Florida oranges. They like the warm nights <clears throat> that they have in Florida uh, and the longer growing season. And uh, they're juice oranges, basically. So <clears throat> even though I have this lovely Valencia orange here, I couldn't, again, in good conscience, suggest that they're going to ripen up nicely for people uh, because citrus ripens in the winter and if these were going to get sweet they would be sweet by this time uh, for instance a mandarin orange at this stage around here would be sweet i have one at home that is perfectly perfectly wonderful that i can pick during the winter um, so again, choosing a, a variety of citrus that will give you fruit that you like is important. Or you know, if you like uh, a decorative plant with oranges hanging on it, then the mention would be great. Make a cute little uh, tree in a container. Um, but if you want a, an orange that you can actually eat and you have a nice warm spot for it, then a navel orange would be the way to go. That would be Washington navel or Robertson navel most commonly. Um, we also have a mandarin over here that doesn't have any fruit on it. So I guess there's not much point in showing it, but um, this is a, is that a clementine? I yeah. can't remember. Okay, so this is a clementine mandarin. Uh, it's a beautiful little tree. Um, and it is just about old enough to flower. It may flower in the spring uh, and give some fruit in, in the winter of 23, 24. Um, and uh, any of the varieties of mandarins will do well in the, in the entire Bay Area, uh, as will Meyer lemons. This is the Meyer, small Meyer lemon. Um, Bears limes, uh, which are the, the limes you most commonly find in the grocery store that are picked green and sold green, but they actually mature yellow. They look a lot like a lemon when they're ripe. Uh, they still taste like a lime, but they look like a lemon. Um, Mexican limes are more difficult because they're quite um, frost tender and they usually uh, will lose most of their foliage during the winter around here. Uh, usually it won't kill them, um, but they'll have to start up fresh and they'll look a little raggedy uh, during the winter. And they won't give you a ton of fruit because it reduces the length of the growing season. And often the blossoms are uh, damaged by the frost. Um, uh, Mexican lime is also a key lime for the same thing. Um, and uh, things like grapefruit, um, again, it depends a little bit on your tastes, obviously, but if you want a grapefruit to sweeten up to any extent, um, you need quite a bit more heat than we have available here. Um, grapefruit are grown in uh, the Central Valley, uh, along with things like peaches, um, uh, where the heat is more reliable. Um, citrus uh, is easy to grow in containers, by the way. I mean, you don't need a container as big as a half wine barrel for most of the citrus. Um, it will uh, grow just fine in a smaller container. You can step it up. This is a what we call a two-gallon container. And this is a five-gallon container over here. So you could step this up as it grew a little bit into a five gallon size. And of course it could be a nicer looking pot, but just talking in terms of the volume uh, and then maybe one size up from that and you could grow it for many, many years. 
Um, of course, citrus trees were grown at, at Versailles in the Orangerie, uh, uh, where it gets very cold in the winter, but it was a, a sort of greenhouse where they could be kept during, during the winter in large wooden uh, containers that they built for them. And uh, they were very successful there. Uh, so uh, I highly recommend citrus if you uh, need to grow in containers or have the opportunity to grow in containers. Uh, the, the trees are more, more reliably easy to uh, shape and keep small. And the dwarf trees, like the Meyer lemon, is a natural dwarf. Um, uh, won't get out of hand on you, uh, and you can easily keep them trimmed. Um, hey, Dan, I'm going to uh, start cutting in if that's okay. Uh, yeah, but... yeah. I just wanted to say we're we're coming to the end of our at least first hour or so, and wanted to thank everyone for uh, you know sticking with us, learning a whole bunch. Also, we've had some really great questions. I've been having fun answering them as we've been going along. Um, and we'll we'll keep you here for a little bit longer, answer some questions, and any more topics you want to bring up, but. Um, would you be okay with answering just a few that I have ready to go? Oh, I don't uh, know. <laughs> well, I'm a little bit jealous. I didn't get to try the Valencia orange, so <laughs> I'm here with them. Um, so I, I have some people that were asking about um, using, once you have the tree planted and once you have it all kind of pruned up and ready to go, especially during the deciduous period, are there some products or things that we should be worried about using for pesticide control or for any of that kinds of stuff um, going in and out of the season, maybe uh, both spring and also winter care? Yes, uh, yeah, good question. Um, <clears throat> deciduous trees, uh, for, for the best pest control, you should plan to spray them with an oil spray and some of the varieties with a copper fungicide. Um, you, should, you should do this separately, um, but this is the copper fungicide here. Um, so horticultural oil, yeah. Oil spray here. Um, I, I brought these particular ones out because they're, uh, they have a built-in hose and sprayer. Um, so that especially if your tree is a little bit larger, you want to be able to hook this onto the hose and then the nozzle here will suck the oil out and mix it with the water automatically as you spray and you'll get enough pressure out of that to be able to get up you know into the tree whereas a little hand spray bottle you're going to have a, a great deal of difficulty doing that so an oil what an oil spray does is cover eggs and larvae of insects primarily uh, to keep them from reproducing for the next year. Uh, and the copper spray is a, an antifungal spray, which is especially important for the stone fruits, um, the plums, peaches, apricots, nectarines, which are all subject to a number of different fungal diseases. With peaches and nectarines, um, peach leaf curl is probably the best known, although maybe not the most damaging. Um, but a win winter spray of copper is about the only thing that can control uh, peach leaf curl. So it's important to do uh, a couple times during the course of the year and uh, the winter, and then the last time you would do it is just as color shows in the flower buds. Uh, after that, you don't spray either of these any any longer. And these are they're both listed for organic gardening. They're both relatively non-toxic to anything other than um, the target uh, beasties. Uh, and during the winter, when there are no flowers, the bees are not out foraging in the trees, and so that's not an issue. Um, so I think um, they're, they're a good way to uh, prevent problems during the year. Um, for the apples, for the uh, problems with the worms in the apples, you have to use um, something like spinosad, which is, a, uh, an, again, organically approved 
um, bacterial spray um, that will at least reduce the number of worms. Uh, the, the reason they're really difficult to control is that uh, they just come along and lay in, the, the moth comes along and lays an egg uh, and it, you're not going to kill the moth with anything that's sprayed on the tree. Um, there aren't any uh, home remedies any longer that would allow them to, you know, kill the moths simply by coming close to the tree. You know, we used to have pesticides like that, but you know, you're talking DDT. <laughs> um, but so the moth comes along, it lays the egg, and then the larva goes inside the developing apple. And uh, it's, it's very hard to control. Uh, and so uh, a little bit of spinosad at the time that the moths are coming might do it just as the larva is eating its way into the base of the bud. But it's it's a tough sell. Um, in orchards, they have elaborate calendars and take take the temperature and you know, all this stuff to know when the moths are coming, but we we can't really do that at home. So yeah. Definitely. Well, that's some really good information. I absolutely, especially during spring or during the middle of the year have people coming in with peach leaf curl or, or damage on their fruit trees and a lot of times I have to recommend them that unfortunately it's not too much you can do during that time it's more during the dormant period when we need to spray these products so it's good to get that information out there early um yeah. thank you for that um I also was wondering do you know anything about um fire blight I had a question about that and I honestly don't have a lot of answers for that kind of question Fire blight is a, a bacterial problem uh, that attacks plants of the rose family, uh, primarily uh, pears and pyracantha, uh, ornamental pyracantha, uh, and it results in a look at the at the tip of the tree like it was uh, burned with a blowtorch. It's black and um, uh, dead and uh, can be quite uh, alarming and damaging. Um, there are uh, products that will help control fire blight. Um, the, um, I think the Monterey um, Complete Disease Control product lists uh, fire blight as one of the things that it will help control. Um, but if you have, especially if you have large ornamental pear trees, which are usually the biggest problem, um, I would recommend you get an arborist out to look at them and they will probably have to spray them with something that's not available to the homeowner um, to help control it. Um, and uh, it, if you prune any of the dead material out, you have to be very careful not to spread it with your pruning shears. Um, you gotta really use the bleach in between every cut uh, in order to do that. So it's it's worth getting a professional out to look at them if you feel like you've got um, a, you know, a valuable tree with fire blight. Definitely, yeah, thank you. That was some very good information. They're also wondering about uh, varieties that were maybe more resistant, but it sounds like it might be certain varieties are just more susceptible to the um, prunuses and stuff. Yeah, it's really it's really just the members of the rose family that get it, and uh, and not all members, but um, pears and pirates are the most common around here. Nice. Um, also, a good tip about the cleaning your pruners and a lot of those kinds of questions. I also had some questions about exfoliating um, and stuff like that. Um, definitely can be going it, gone into, and we can talk about it at the stores, but we also have this uh, fruit tree pruning class coming up and that's a perfect one to ask Elizabeth about. Um, so stay tuned for that one as well. Um, yeah. And then uh, we're, we're kind of coming to the end or so. I definitely uh, pass it to you soon for some last thoughts. Um, I had like one kind of question that was almost for me, but is there any kinds of fruit trees that we end up having that are dioecious flowers, which means like there's the male and the female flower, they're not like um, together that you have to worry about? Uh, should people be looking out for that or most of the fruit trees we have uh, have both male and female parts in their flowers? Most of them are what we call perfect flowers. They have both the female and male parts to them. Uh, avocados are the most obvious 
uh, plants that we grow that have both male and female flowers. And uh, interestingly enough, unlike say a holly, where the females are on one plant and the males are on another, and so only the females will make berries, but they need a male to pollinate them in order to make the berries. Uh, avocados have both male and female flowers on the same plant, but they open up at different times on that oh. plant. So that prevents them from self-pollinating. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you, you need another uh, compatible tree. And, and so there are two uh, uh, sort of races of avocados, one called A and the other called B, interestingly. And the male flowers on A will open at the same time as the female flowers on B and vice versa. Uh, and so that's the way you get so uh, cross-pollinating in avocados. Um, <laughs> I'm not aware of any other of uh, the typical fruit trees that we grow have a complicated oh. that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Good. I uh, I just wanted to know because sometimes people have asked me about that, and I kind of read the labels because usually the label will tell you if there is that kind of distinction. Um, I think I was selling a um, kiwi plant recently, and that actually had it on there, and I was like, oh, it's good to to at least mention it. But it sounds like it's not something you have to worry about too much with most of our fruit trees. Um, right. But also, I I think you know letting people know that if many people within your neighborhood have other fruit trees. Uh, a lot of times that cross-pollination gets to happen and your your bounty actually gets bigger the more your neighbors have fruit trees too. That's right. Uh, the bees will travel a long distance and they have an, <clears throat> an interesting knack for finding the same kind of plant, even though it's a different variety. They seem to like to carry home the pollen from that kind of plant. And so they'll they'll go quite a distance in order to uh, interact with different flowers of the same species, which is very handy for us. Very good. All right. Well, um, if there's not too many other kinds of topics you wanted to go into, I know we're kind of running to the, the end of our timeline that we should be telling this class. I also wanted to, again, thank everyone that joined us today for the live recording of it with all your questions um, and all your support. And then everyone who is watching this in the future, thank you for checking in on us. Um, hopefully you can come to one of our other more live classes and continue watching our videos online. Um, also, if you have any specific questions, it's always wonderful to, for you to come into our stores, talk to our staff. We're able to like accumulate a whole bunch of knowledge through all the people that work in our store so we can uh, hopefully answer your questions to our best of our abilities. And also you can email us at the, um, the Slow Garden, the Garden Guru, which is on our website, uh, a link to be able to talk to them and they can answer those questions. They, they also sometimes ask us and we can help um, find some cool answers to all these different things that happen in our garden. Um, but until next time, uh, again, thank you again for joining us today. We have more classes coming up. Thank you, Jen, for filming and Dan for doing the whole talk and presentation. Um, and yeah. <laughs> I guess uh, have a wonderful Saturday um, and we'll we'll see you next time. Thank you. Ciao.